Let's take a look at Let's see, when I, chapter, uh, I want us to review a little bit of chapter 7 as it closes. Because the first, yeah, chapter 7 as it closes, the first verse of chapter 8 probably most likely belongs at the end of chapter 7. And if you remember, we were talking about the 144,000 who were equally divided amongst the 12 tribes according to this list of Israel and uh, they were appointed to be witnesses, at least that's the implication and the assumption of, of uh, s scholars and Bible studiers so that evangelization can continue even after the rest of the church has been gone. And so one of the things that we must remember in the midst of all of the judgments and all of the terrible things that are happening in the uh, tribulation, and this, by the way, is uh, probably the first half, first three and a half years of tribulation, what we're going to talk about um, today with the seventh seal begins likely the last half of the tribulation, which is the great <laughs> tribulation part of that seven year period. Um, but there are many, many tribulation saints. They were washed, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them they will no longer hunger, they will no longer thirst, the sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a prelude to the, the, the beginning of the most terrible time in history. Uh, these optimistic words talking about the redeemed. And then we see this very mysterious thing that happens uh, first recorded in chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now one of the things that I think we pointed out is it's pretty noisy in heaven most of the time. There's holy holies, there's... Uh, harps, there's incense, there's a lot of things going on. It's not a silent, uh, uh, not a silent night uh, in heaven. But here's this period of silence. And 30 minutes uh, is the blink of an eye in heavenly timekeeping. But there was something about the, the prelude to the breaking of the seventh seal that caused heaven to be paralyzed for a moment mm -hmm. and to step back in awe mm -hmm. and anticipation. We will see in every series of seven things a pause after uh, or before the final seventh. Um, so here we have seen the six seals broken and then there was this interlude discussion about the 144,000, and now we have uh, the breaking of the seventh seal, which begins the uh, trumpet judgments, and uh, we'll talk about those things here for a little while. One of the things that is of interest, and again, can't be dogmatic about it, but it's interesting to note that if you, if you think back through all of your, his, your biblical history, was there a time, as we think about parallels and prophecy, remember we said that, that our contemporary thinking about prophecy is something is said and predicted and something comes true, but in Jewish thought, as reflected in the Old Testament that's reflected in the New Testament, that prophecy is often in symbolism uh, and uh, patterns. One of the interesting studies 
is to go back and look at the story of Joshua, which is translated what? Yeshua. Yeshua. And to think about Joshua being on the edge of reclaiming territory that uh, had been lost. And remember we talked about the, the deed and the restoration of uh, the earth that Jesus purchased and that the scroll that we talk about may be a deed or a will uh, that restores the, the land and the earth um, to its intended purpose. And the uh, siege that Joshua first engaged in on the other side of the river was against the capital city of Jericho. And despite what the song says, Joshua may have fought the Battle of Jericho, but he did not win the Battle of Jericho because that battle was entirely God's, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so for reasons unknown to the people, but they were obedient, they were told to circle Jericho seven times and on the seventh time, they were to make a lot of noise and the wall, the, the city would become theirs and the walls collapsed. Again, not, not through military might, but through God's work in their obedience. But what happened the first six circles? Silence. Silence. So you have the number, you have the silence, you have the imagery of uh, reclaiming land, you have uh, the very name of Joshua uh, reflecting a type of Christ. And so th those are just a few of the symbolic parallels that we see uh, in the Old Testament, and this particularly in the book of Joshua, that uh, can correspond here. As we go through some of the judgments uh, or chaoses in, in talking about the trumpet judgments, we'll see a reflection, you'll automatically think, well, that's the same thing that happened uh, during the, uh, the, the, the time of Moses and God convincing Pharaoh to let my people go. Mm -hmm. And you'll see many similarities there, pretty interesting. Also, um, well, well, we'll talk about it when we come there. I saw the seven angels, you notice it says the seven angels, so that indicates some specific angels, not just random heavenly hosts. Uh, we know about Gabriel, and we know about Michael, and we know about Satan, the fallen angel, but we really don't talk a whole lot about other angels. But in other um, extra-biblical literature, Jewish literature, we actually have the name of probably what these seven angels were. There is an order, like we are familiar with in the military, there's, a, there's an angelic order, um, and uh, so these seven angels had some specific responsibilities. They stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them, and again, was there a roll of trumpets in the Old Testament? Yes, multiple times. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar he was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. So we know what uh, incense represents. It is the prayers of people. So whether these are the prayers at the moment, the prayers just of the martyrs or the prayers of uh, saints all along, do, do, do you ever think about the possibility that when we pray, when we're in prayer time individually or when we're in prayer time corporately, that, um, and we've talked about this, how precious that is, what a precious uh, uh, sensation that is to God when we offer our prayers up. It's like incense. You know, if you're a child of the 70s, you probably had some incense in your bedroom. Uh, if you were a radical child of the 70s, that incense smell was very functional. <laughs> rather than merely meditating um, 
But, but that, that is the, the pleasantness of the aroma to God when yeah. we pray. Those are sacred, sacred moments. Um, and perhaps that our collective prayers over the ages and over time are being stored up and released during the end times. How many times have we prayed the Lord's Prayer? May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's an end times prayer. Uh, and when the martyrs were saying, how long, O Lord, when they were crying out from beneath the, uh, the altar and saying, when will we get justice? When will we get justice? Mm -hmm. One of the things that confuses us a little bit because we have this loving God and we don't like to think about uh, hailstones and, and uh, uh, fiery meteors and uh, oceans becoming polluted and all those kinds of things is that the, the martyrs who, who suddenly have this heavenly awareness, which we will have when we get there, all things will begin to make sense. Um, they're crying out for justice. And so it's not just God who is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm mad and I'm gonna punish people, but the martyrs are now seeing the arc of history and the evil that people have chosen that says, yes, we need justice. So we know about the incense. Now let's take a look at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of the saints at the golden altar. There were two altars in the temple uh, and in the, um, in the uh, tabernacle. And it, the Bible tells us that the temple is, that the temple that was built and, and, and with very careful instructions is like the, uh, it, it is a representation of the heav heavenly realm where we have the presence of God there, the Holy of Holies uh, and different layers and different functions. And we're gonna have a, a, a new temple at the very end of the age but one of the features of the temple was, were these two altars. One was the altar of sacrifice, and the other was the altar right before you go into the Holy of Holies, and that was um, the, the golden um, altar, which was before the mercy seat. The smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints, uh, went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. The angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. Do you remember that one of the victories that Joshua had was because of hail that fell from the sky and pummeled their enemies, right? So here we have another allusion to the Old Testament uh, pattern of prophecy. So a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. Now, there are folks who make all kinds of conclusions about this. They're probably right. They're just too deep for me. You know, what's the significance of a third? What's the significance of the fact that these are natural uh, disasters that happen uh, to elements of the earth? I was talking to a, uh, an old fellow this morning at the coffee shop. Uh, was, I was running a little bit late this morning because I was having some really productive uh, conversations at the coffee shop. Uh, people think I just like coffee. No, it's, it's more than that. Um, but I, I was able to share with him that we were talking uh, about the book of Revelation. And uh, he's, he's a bit of a scientist. His background is in physics and engineering. I'm not sure that he has a degree, but uh, he certainly literate in those things. And he's still, he still, he sits there with, uh, some of you know Al. Um, he sits there with his graph paper and he's always plotting some kind of machinery or 
uh, aircraft or something. He's a former pilot also. And I said, you know, the book of Revelation is indeed hard to understand. But then, as I mentioned last week, the book of Daniel or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Zephaniah or Jeremiah would have been ununderstandable by contemporaries. We only know that Daniel was prophesying about Alexander the Great and the kingdoms and the sequence of things. Uh, in retrospect, and someday there will be those who will look at the prophecies of Revelation or the vision of Revelation and say, yes, there is a God. It's evidenced in the record. It's evident that he's all-knowing. It's evident that the world is in his hand, that he's sovereign, so I better get on board with the Lord. And there will be people saved during the time of tribulation. tribulation. Um, and so I said, we don't, we don't fully understand what is written by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. But we have never been at a time in history where Revelation makes more sense than it does in the last 50 to 100 years. Could somebody in the 1600s or 400 AD um, imagine some of the things that are happening uh, that are unveiled in Revelation? Could we have imagined that there was something like hail and fire mixed with blood, whether that's blood that comes down or blood that results. Uh, and a third of the earth burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Did any of you watch TV or read the paper? <laughs> Have you heard about the environmentalists that are panicked about the increase in temperature and about the destruction of our environment and habitat and all kinds of things happening in the natural world that are a threat to the existence of man? Do you think that there may be a God consciousness associated with that? Because these are the things that are going to happen. And we may be seeing, um, now there are extremists on both sides, right? But we may be seeing some fulfillment of some of the um, uh, some of the scary claims that environmentalists uh, are, are making. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea. Can you imagine what a great mountain, it says like, so you know when we look at symbolism uh, or metaphors or similes, Remember, a, a metaphor is when we say um, the bright orb uh, of lantern light rose in the east. That, that's a metaphor for the sun, right? Uh, or if we say the flashlight hit my eyes like the blazing of noonday sun, that's a simile because it's like or as. So sometimes in Revelation we see these words that indicate that it's symbolism or indicates that it's descriptive. So John often has no contemporary words to describe exactly what he's seeing. And so he says, well, it's like this. I'll give you a little image of what this is, what this looks like. So it's like a great mountain ablaze with fire hurled into the sea. What's the latest claim about the next meteor that's going to hit the earth? There's some out there coming. There's a one in 300 chance uh, that in the next uh, couple of centuries, we're going to have something hit us, right? So uh, we kind of scoff at those people that say, you know, the chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but one of these days there's going to be a flaming mountain coming out of the sky. <laughs> yeah. Right? And somebody's last words are going to be, told you so. <laughs> <laughs> so a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, 
and a third of the ships were destroyed. How many ships do you think are out on the ocean doing commerce and recreation right now in 2023 globally? Uh, 50,000 was the last estimate that I had. So 50,000 are floating around there. So that means if this were to happen today, um, then you can do the math. It's gonna be a lot of, of fun. Um, and you'll notice again, first you have nature and then you have the ocean. Um, and imagine the effects of that on the environment and on humanity. Okay, there's no green grass. What does that mean? Some of us have been through or know people that have been through times of uh, that kind of drought, that kind of lack of, of feed for animals, and it has a tremendous ripple effect uh, throughout the population. The third trumpet, and you notice that, there are, that these trumpets are warnings. Um, so here, here, here comes. When you go back and you look at the uh, plagues on Egypt during a time when Moses was trying to freeze people, some of those have warnings and some of them do not. That's an interesting study if you go back and, and see, um, you know, if, if this doesn't happen, this is what I'm gonna do. So the graciousness of God is to provide some warning as he does in this book. The third trumpet, the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from heaven. Now, it doesn't say like a star, it says a star. But one thing we know about the word star is that it also sometimes refers to angels. So when you look back in the first couple of chapters of Revelation, talks about stars, it talks about either the messenger for the church, which might be the pastor, or it might be an angel that's assigned to the church. And so this may not be an astro, uh, astronomical uh, image, but actually a person. You say, well, that, why is that kind of language uh, so ambiguous? <coughs> Have any of you ever met a star? There's rock stars, there's movie stars. So we say that today in contemporary language as well. What do we know about Satan? He is a fallen angel, right? So it's very possible, probable, um, that this star blazing like a torch is falling from heaven, is Satan. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs of water. Now we, had, we went from land to ocean waters now to fresh waters. The name of the star is Wormwood and the third of the waters became Wormwood so many of the people died from the waters because they had made had been made bitter. If you do a little study on the word Wormwood it's a bitter herb. It was used in medicine but like many medicines it can have a terrible poisonous effect as well. If you've ever watched any of the pharmaceutical ads on TV there's always that, you know, half of the ad is the asterisk saying, this very likely will kill you, but we want you to ask your doctor about it. <laughs> um, so it's like hemlock or some other poison. It's interesting, and I heard two commentators say this. You remember what happened in Ukraine some years ago when that nuclear power plant yes. blew up? Yeah. Chernobyl. Chernobyl. That's the word. That's the word. Um, in Ukraine, in Ukraine. Many people died from the waters because they had made bid, been made bitter. The fourth trumpet, now all along, all along here, people had the opportunity. Now some people think that these are almost instantaneous uh, rather than sequential, and, and that's possible. But if the purpose of God is to alert people to his presence and his power, then um, the increasing intensity would have that evangelical purpose. So there is justice, there is punishment, there is wrath, but there is also a plea from God to come back into his fold. 
The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. I looked and heard an eagle flying high overhead. Uh, your King James probably says uh, angel, but it's, uh, and those aren't necessarily in conflict. You remember one of the faces of the heavenly beings that was um, seen in God's presence was that of an eagle? Uh, flying high overhead, crying out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe. And when we see things repeated three times, we know that's an emphasis, but we also know that this is the fourth trumpet, and there are woe, 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 there's three trumpets left. And so again, you get this angelic warning to the earth. This is not it. It's not, you can't just say, okay, well, that's, that's done with, we survived, I can go on the way I want to. It is, please, please, please pay attention to who I am. Pay attention to my purpose. Pay attention to my fulfilled prophecy. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to my omniscience. Pay attention to my omnipresence. Come to me. Come to me. This is evangelical. We know that uh, it, is, it is commonly thought, may not be entirely true, but the common thought is nobody escapes from addiction until they have gotten as low as they can possibly get. We also know that if parents do not allow their children to exercise some of their own free will, then they become resentful and spoiled children, right? We have some of you today are probably still struggling with the absolute control that your parents tried to have over your life. They didn't want you to be what you wanted to be. They didn't want you to marry who you wanted to marry. They didn't want you to make the choices you made. Um, they just wanted them to be a, a better version of them or to, to do exactly what they did, right? That is a stifling, there's a, there's a point at which if you do not have choices to make, even if they're the wrong choices, then you do not have the freedom as an individual to love who you want to love and to live your life. That is why, I believe, God gave us free will. And why oppositional things like evil and demons exist so that we can make a choice, so that our love will be genuine. And God continues to invite us into that. Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because the remaining trumpet blasts that the three angels are about to sound. So this indicates that it is sequential rather than simultaneous. Now we could easily move into uh, chapter 9 and we'll do that next week, Lord willing. But we can remember what does this mean for today? What this means is that God is going to continue to reveal himself. He is going to give people the opportunity through crisis and tragedy to come to him and obey him. It also shows that he is sovereign, that we have hope in our salvation, and that in the midst of all of the difficulties of the world, that we have a God who is just and everyone will be ultimately accountable. And it's an on-off switch. You're either gonna be covered with the blood of Christ and, and be deemed righteous and worthy of joining God's presence or not. It's not a scale of behavior. It's not a, um, it's not a, a measure of holiness. It's a measure of whether we have accepted what Christ has done in the study of prophecy, in the study of Revelation, in the study of the Old Testament, we must first and foremost lift up Jesus and preach him and him crucified. Amen. And we see his victory in the book of Revelation.